These were the men who ran the biggest, the fastest growing, most exciting industry of all. They worked for Ford, Chrysler and General Motors, the greatest corporations on the planet. From their corporate headquarters in Detroit, they effectively ran the world's car industries. Here, talk of accidents and death was anathema. It destroyed the romance and mystique of motoring, threatened the ever-rising car sales. But in 1956, one man was about to step out of line. The head of Ford at that time was the young whiz kid, Robert McNamara. One day, he received a visit from some scientists from Cornell University. They were working on the novel idea of saving lives by packaging the occupants of cars like a carton of eggs. The trouble was, they had no money. They were operating on a shoestring. You won't believe this, but in carrying out their packaging, experiments, they were literally dropping human skulls, packaged in different ways, down the stairwells of Cornell's student dormitories. That was their lab. When the amount of money they needed might have been on the order of a few hundred thousands of dollars. And, and Ford agreed to contribute, I've forgotten what, but let's say a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. Chrysler put in a few tens of thousands. GM refused. Impressed with the Cornell research, McNamara put the first safety cars on the road. By today's standards, they weren't much, but in 1956, it was almost heresy. Optional lifeguard padding on the instrument panel and sun visors of the 1956 Ford. Ford offers this padding because statistics show 38% of accident injuries to front seat passengers are caused by being thrown forward against hard interior surfaces. You can also have these optional nylon seat belts, one-third stronger than airline requirements. All these safety features add up to exclusive lifeguard design, a Ford first for safety first. As the 1956 models rolled off the line, Ford management received a phone call. It was from General Motors, the giant of the industry. A senior executive there was demanding that Ford drop McNamara's safety campaign. It could damage car sales. Such was the might of General Motors, the warning was taken seriously. GM feared it would lead to a reduction in automotive sales. It sounds absurd to you. It certainly sounded absurd to me. But they believed it so strongly, they put tremendous pressure on Ford to uh, force a reduction in our emphasis on safety. They thought it would take the romance, if you will, out of car buying. Insane. And here is Ford's new lifeguard series. Watch what happens when these two tanks. What a wallop! But he wasn't injured because the steering wheel cushioned the shock and his body never touched the steering post. The campaign was scrapped. McNamara left to become Secretary of Defense and to wage war in Vietnam. In Detroit, the old order was restored. It would be nearly two decades before anyone tried anything like that again. Can we make it? That's always a very important thing. And how are you going to make it? Just get down and put something on the paper, which I'm trying to do right now. In Britain, the biggest change in our motoring history was just taking shape. Everything was in utmost secrecy. No one was allowed into, apart from those few who were working on it, no one's allowed into the department at all. If you try to finish drawing it, you might recognise it. <laughs> it's a mini. The Mini, the so-called car of the century. It was designed by Alec Isigonis, the most charismatic and cantankerous car designer in Britain. Isigonis had got that many ideas so fast. It was a bit of a job to keep up with him. It was a challenge. But he always insisted on the word elegance. Style to him was a bit of anathema, I think. 
A car was a functional instrument, like a hammer. John Shepard was responsible for putting flesh and blood into Isigonus' wildest idea. A car with the engine set sideways, driving the front wheels, which were tiny, and placed at the corners of the car to maximize interior room. The Mini was designed at a time of petrol rationing and was meant as a rival to foreign bubble cars. Reporters were expecting a town runabout, a shopping bag on wheels, but at the press launch they found they had a racing car on their hands. We were watching these press people going around, very dentally they were going, and I said, come on, let's, let's show them what we can do with this thing. And we got one, we took one of them each, whipped it around the thing, to the corner, back again, but three laps there, put the wheels back in the pound there, and walked away. As we walked away, Izzy Gones has obviously seen us do it, and he came and gave us a body kick for it. But damage had been done. Press people were seeing what, what we were doing. Of course, they are going to beat us. Off they went. All, all I know is those 10 cars all needed a complete new set of tires running around there. They, they whipped a lot off. The Mini was truly revolutionary. It stood for everything that was best in British design but it also inherited the vices of most other small British cars of that era, even exaggerated them because of its size. Certain injuries began to repeat themselves over and over again, and Professor Mackay's new accident research team began to find out why. Supposing you have a rollover accident at night time, in this car you've got the filler neck to the fuel tank that's sticking out a long way, so in a roll it just gets sheared off You've got free fuel coming out, you've got an electrical source, you've got a fire, you get lots of people burnt to death. And here you've got a door latch design, which is just like a door latch in a house, so that if the side of the car gets stretched, the door will just swing open, people will be ejected, they'll get fatal and serious head and neck injuries from landing on the ground. You've got a seat that is just attached at the front, it hinges, nothing to hold it down at the back so that people in the rear will come shooting forward the people in the front will be crushed by the weight of the occupants behind you've got a really short nose on the vehicle so that in a frontal impact the engine comes back the transverse bulkhead comes back you get really serious uh, disabling injuries to the feet and the ankles and the lower legs uh, from that design so I said some fairly unpleasant things about this little car uh, in the local press and elsewhere, and I had a summons to go to Longbridge to see Alec Isagonis, the uh, designer of the car. And he was a dominant uh, senior engineer at the time. He put me on the carpet in front of his desk, and he said, uh, young man, I design my cars that have got such good brakes, such good steering and handling, that if somebody gets into a crash, it's their own fault. And I thought this was a particularly stupid approach to have, and I told him in no uncertain terms what I thought, so we had a good stand-up row about it. And, uh, of course, one of the things that happened, you know, to the Mini was that it couldn't meet the early safety standards in North America. It had to be withdrawn, and thus it was a failure uh, because there was no market for it in the best market in the world. Millions were spent on correcting those early problems and making sure the Mini meets today's safety standards. Forty years on, it's become one of the world's top-selling cars of all time.